Coming up next, guys, I mean, the value doesn't stop. Um, one of my good friends, someone I have the privilege of coaching, uh, New York Times uh, bestselling author, we're hoping coming right up, a brand new book called A Road to Purpose uh, and uh, just tons of value. Uh, Greg uh, Pestinger is uh, a fantastic guy. You can see him and John and Greg all sitting there. They're about to present to us. He has a thriving coaching business where they mentor young men. They take businesses to the next level. Uh, and his topic, I think, is so huge. And, you know, Ilya, you just demonstrated this vulnerability uh, and your leadership superpower. And Greg has done this all around the world for people here in the United States. Le leading with vulnerability is not about being reckless with your emotions or failing, uh, falling apart as a leader. It's about being aware of your innermost world and feeling it, recognizing it and sharing it in the right way. Uh, he's got some great stuff coming up for you. Mr. Greg, how you doing, brother? Doing great, Keith. How you doing? Man, great. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you all. I mean, I'm really looking forward to this, brother. Take it away. All right. Can you all hear me okay? We're going to share our screen now, and we'll get started. Ali, while we're, while we're doing that, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, it was incredible. Uh, it spoke directly to, to me and to everyone else. Uh, while we're getting started here, are you seeing the screen okay? We see it, brother. You see it? All right, well, let's go. So uh, my name is Greg Pestinger, as Keith said, and I think the thing that we all have in common, and I want to just give a big shout out uh, to Keith. He's been coaching me now for a year. We just signed up for another year. And I have to tell you that as a, as a man that struggles with a lot of things that, that men struggle with, especially around this notion of vulnerability that we're going to talk to today, that Keith has been instrumental, life-changing in my role. And hopefully you will see, see that come out uh, in this talk today. We're coming to you from Louisville, Kentucky, home of, home of the greatest, Muhammad Ali, uh, what an incredible man both in the ring and, and in life around the world. And we'd like to look to him as, a, as an example of what leadership and vulnerability can be. And there's been probably no, no global presence more so than him that, is, that has expressed the power of vulnerability uh, in his life. So we'll move on to the, to the next. Yep. Uh, I get it. Click on the next one. Okay, well, I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and go, go ahead and go while we're moving. Here. So, uh, real quick, sorry about that. Uh, so, so Jake, John, and I really, and Keith mentioned it. Uh, what we what we have found our passion, our purpose in life, is really addressing young men and young people in general between that age of about eighteen and thirty four. So, we may be talking to your brothers. We may be talking to your sons. We may be talking to people that you mentor and coach in your life. And you will probably see what we're gonna talk about today in a, in a very big way. What we're really about, what we're really about is, is this notion of inspiring greatness in young people in particular. We transform the lives of people so that they can be more, give more and have more. And this could be no more important than it is today with all the struggles and challenges that we all have in our life. So with that, we'll go. We'll move on to the next one. So the question I have, and this is right out of right out of the book that uh, that Keith was so gracious of introducing to you, it's why are we so empty inside? In all of human history, there has never been a better time to be alive. Advancement in science and technology has put at our very fingertips all that we could ever imagine, all that we could ever want, all the opportunity that we could ever hope for. People today are more educated, more passionate, and wealthier than they've been in all other decades combined. That is especially true about our youngest, our youngest people. Yet we are empty inside, and they are in a significant and epidemic way. It seems that the harder we try to achieve nirvana, the further we fall behind. Suicide rates are up almost in all categories. Stress, anxiety, depression are at an all-time high, and relief is nowhere in sight. I was one of those guys. And that's what I'm here to share is one of those stories today. Like many of you, I'd achieved most of my dreams. One of those guys who had spent a lifetime collecting things, promotions, and symbols 
that in some way said to myself that I matter, that I made it. The reality was that I didn't like myself much, that I was suffering from ongoing mental health struggles and covering them up with staying busy. I made it a point to shun vulnerability of all kinds. It was weak. Men did not do that. Men never asked for help. And it nearly ended all of the relationships with the people that I loved the most. Worse yet, I was empty inside. I didn't love myself. I was headed down an unstable path, an unsustainable one. While I was successful, I wasn't fulfilled. And I wasn't successful because I wasn't fulfilled. Some facts. Today, one in four young men have considered suicide. One in four, 25%. There are 50 people on this, on this uh, webinar today. Think about that, 25% would be considering suicide if you were a young population. It's the second leading cause of death next to accidents. One in two are suffering from mental health crisis. Our generation, our generation, the fastest growing cause of death is also suicide in 50 plus. Toxic masculinity is at an all time high. Why is that? Why is that? Long story short, I had failed to sharpen both sides of my sword. John will now talk to you uh, about that. Hi, everybody. I'm John Salmon, and I, I work with Greg and Jake here. And uh, I'm going to share a little bit with why we chose uh, this, this approach to vulnerability. You know, so what is sharpening the other side of the sword? In life, uh, we all know this. The choices we make are determined by the perseverance of our beliefs. Our desires and aversions, our likes and dislikes, they push and pull us uh, out of our own ways. If we're like a, a tightrope walker, for example, these beliefs shake our rope. Uh, they knock us off balance and can often lead to our downfall. So how we master this energy is crucially important. In war, to Sun Tzu, there are two main types of approaches, direct and indirect, inferring the simple nature of warfare, to either approach head on or not, to share or withhold, to press on or to wait. In thinking, to the psychologist and philosopher Carl Jung, there are two main types of approaches affecting our thinking and consequential ways of being and how we show up. Conscious forces and shadow forces. Conscious forces call what we're familiar with, what we're already doing, what's a habit. And shadow forces call upon what we are feeling or don't even understand, can't put words to. Every man to young has his unconscious femininity, every woman her unconscious masculine. To both Sun Tzu and Carl Jung, all approaches call for our mastery of these competing energies. Both are required for balance, both absolutely necessary for success anywhere in our lives. Much like the sage and saboteur before us, absolutely perfect demonstration. Um, but for modern people today, and the reason both these messages are so important, especially young people, they were given false information about how to master life. I can speak for all three of us in this room. At, at one point, given false information about how to master life, that there's two arguments, uh, that a man should lay down all his natural impulses because they possess a potential to do harm. That makes sense. Uh, and a traditional man might rebuttal that, that men are always right. Uh, but that's totally naive to the flip side of our behavior and its risks. The misguidance, though, is that there are two choices, either expression or suppression of, of the energies that, that we have naturally. And that's not. To follow either path exclusively uh, leaves us forever at least half empty. Uh, and so a quote from Lao Tzu sums up best for me in the Tao Te Ching. Uh, the great way is easy, yet people prefer the side path. Be aware when things are out of balance, when rich speculators prosper while farmers lose their land, when government officials spend money on weapons instead of cures, when the upper class is extravagant and irresponsible while the poor have nowhere to turn. This is robbery and chaos. It is not in keeping with the way. All of you here today were provided with a framework of how to be a man or a woman from society, from your dad, from your mom, from friends, from grandparents, from teachers, from any number of people you've encountered throughout your lives. You're told to be good, 
bad, smart, nice, obedient, a rebel. And today we get to sort through these myths, the masculine and the feminine, direct and indirect, conscious and unconscious. Uh, call it the head and the heart. Call it the sage and the saboteur. Um, but how we bring those together all the time is what we're focused on. How to, as Carl Jung would say, integrate and sharpen both sides of the sword. Thank you for that, John. Hello, everyone. my name is Jake. Uh, John and Greg, what they just did there was to really set the stage for what we're going to be talking to you about, about sharpening both sides of the sword, about leading with the head and the heart to create a sense of vulnerability. So in just a moment, John is going to talk to you about the state of mankind and how this is setting us up for a lack of vulnerability. Then Greg is going to tell a great story where there's a lack of vulnerability, the way it really rang true and the consequences of that. And to tie it up, I'm going to talk to you about our formula for vulnerability and what it looks like in action. And then lastly, we're going to throw it back to Keith, who's going to open up the questions for you all. So John, go ahead and take us away. <laughs> Thank you. So like I said, uh, young people today, especially young men, have been given false information about, about how to show up, how to be, um, that they have to choose one way or another. And this is just not true. Uh, to me, this ideology has not split uh, the psyche of just, of just men, uh, but it's split and divided our entire world. Uh, in politics, we have to be on the right or left. Uh, to some men, to be on the left is to be soft or to be a pussy. To others, to be on the right is to be insensitive or be a Nazi. Any rational person knows that this is not the case of politics. Um, if anything has been proven to us though, you know, it's that there are not two camps of people. There are a billion individuals. If only we trust them to be that. And, and speaking of individuals, you know, it doesn't mean that we're not disconnected, we're, we're disconnected from one another. Uh, you know, if this 20, 20 years proven anything, it's really that we're all interconnected way more than we were ever comfortable with. Uh, one person's health around you can be determined by another. Each decision we make affects other people's decisions. We are responsible for, for lives all around us. Uh, and, you know, we don't always acknowledge how close to proximity we are to one another. And this closeness to a large degree, I believe, torments us for some reason. Um, and that reason, I think, is that we want others to exist by our rules, for things to make sense, to come from that, the head and not the heart. But they won't. They won't ever make sense. Some people won't wear their mask. They won't exercise. They won't eat right. Family members, friends. And we can't make them. All we can do is what we know to do what makes sense to us. And to me, this understanding that we can only control our actions and ours alone is paramount to this concept of vulnerability, trust, and faith. When we live our way the best we can, we're being vulnerable. When we are vulnerable, we're called to trust others will accept us and love us anyways. And when we can trust ourselves and others to be who we are for them and for them to be who they are for us, we can have faith that we can actually get along that every mess will be sorted out and that whatever comes our way is happening for us and not to us. To me, vulnerability is like weakening our steel. And then trust is sharpening it alongside others. And faith is knowing that our actions will empower others. Steel sharpening steel. So let me tell you a little story. As Keith mentioned, I'm a coach and I have a lot of friends who are coaches and trainers and transformation. One of my friends, one of my coaches that I hold dear in my heart was working with a young boy. Uh, this coach was a friend of mine. So we talked often about different techniques. He was mentoring this boy. He became more like a brother, a friend, and eventually a son that he had never had. He and his wife did not have children. My friend pushed the boy. He knew what was the best for him. He knew he would be president on campus. He knew he would get good grades. He knew, and he wouldn't satisfy for anything less than allowing him the opportunity to reconnect with a fa his family. And the boy, he trusted my friend with his life in every way. My friend kept pushing, ignoring the feelings the boy was having inside about what he actually wanted. After all, my friend knew best. He was always right. He was always right. He believed in the boy and would never let him fail. 
After all, he loved him. He also knew the boy was a people pleaser and would follow every single direction to the law, even though he was empty inside. One day, the boy stopped answering my friend's calls and pushed him away in the most painful possible way. He ghosted him. He stopped emailing him, stopped picking up emails, stopped interacting with him on social media, texts, phone calls, went unheard. It made my friend extremely angry. He wrote the boy off as a quitter, a mistake for giving him his time. After all, he knew best. He had placed conditions. He had blamed the boy. He had made excuses and put those on the shoulder of the boy of why the relationship had fallen apart. The voices in his head said, fuck it. You know better than to let people into your heart that can hurt you. Just do it yourself. We spent a lot of time together on that one. Then it happened. Without warning, he fell apart. His heart broke. His own life began to go to hell. He had given up on his ability to help people. Well, that coach friend of mine is me. And the men I loved and nearly lost are these two guys. The master of the universe was not through with me or with them in my life. The moral of the story was that not that I had loved them, I did. It was that I loved them the way I wanted to be loved not the way they wanted to be loved. Worse yet, I put a wall up around my own heart and didn't let them love me back. There is no more selfish thing, I believe to this day, than that. We as men need to be loved and we need to love. It's not a weakness. I have found it to be courage at the highest level. The fear of being vulnerable, knowing that you might be hurt by letting people in, is the biggest lie that evil can place in our head. The need to be right, to always be right, the resistance we cause in our relationships because of it, is evil. It takes away from us the very joy, the very image of God that we were placed here to be. When you accept that, when you accept vulnerability, the payoff is often a life of meaning and purpose as intended by the master of the universe. A life of surrender is not quitting or letting go or giving up or giving in. That's the belief that I had. It's about letting go, about letting go of always needing to be right about letting go of always knowing what's best for other people instead of having a relationship with them so that they can share with you what's in their heart. The need to always be right and to win at any cost, I found, was the loneliest place a human being could be. Today, I lead an incredible life of love, prosperity, and new beginnings because these guys, didn't walk away. First time in my life, they didn't walk away when I tried to push them away. If vulnerability was about being passive, about quitting, it wouldn't take so much courage to do. I failed to sharpen the love side of my sword. The question I have for you as we continue on with this talk is how about you? Where are you with the people that you love? Where have you failed to sharpen the other side of the sword? So Greg, thank you for, for sharing that story in regards to um, how a lack of vulnerability can impact us. And, and so now I'm gonna dive into how we, can, how we can cultivate this environment of vulnerability with the people around us that we care about and that we love. So I wanna start with a quote uh, by Brene Brown. 
she once said that vulnerability is not weakness. And that myth is profoundly dangerous. Vulnerability is the birthplace of connection and the path to the feeling of worthiness. If it doesn't feel vulnerable, then the sharing probably isn't constructive. So I want to go back to that last part and resonate it. If it doesn't feel vulnerable, then the sharing probably isn't constructive. So I want you guys to lean in right now to what I'm about to say. Because we all have relationships, people we care about, our children, our parents, our spouses, our coworkers that we care about so deeply that we aren't connecting with on the level that we want to. And it'll be so easy just to let this gloss over you and you not really dive into the questions I'm gonna be, gonna be asking and, and the advantages and insights that we're gonna be sharing. So we, we have a formula for vulnerability and sticking on to our a persona of swords and steel sharpened steels, our, our formula is sharp. So the S in sharp is set a successful standard. You want to connect more with the people close to you. You want to feel like you really know what is going on in their life. You want them to really know that you care. But what standard are you setting? Are you not making any time for real conversation? Are you answering questions with a one word response? Of course, life gets busy, but connection is a must all of the time. Set the successful standard in your life so that the people around you will mirror you. So the people you care about connecting with the most will meet you where you want them to meet you. So S, set a successful standard. H in sharp is harmonize. Harmonize. Do you feel like you're on different wavelengths with the people around you? You feel like you and your partner are missing each other with your connection. You feel like your parents still don't understand you and what you want in life. Your kids don't seem to be opening up to you in the manner that you want them to. Why? There's no harmony. There's no alignment of vision or goals. If you feel like your significant other or children or parents never make time to sit down with you and really discuss what is going on, then you need to tell them. Harmonize with them on this vision of what you want to happen, want you, what you want to happen. Create a shared vision of what vulnerability looks like in a relationship, whether it be a phone call with your parents, a dinner with a significant other, or a game of catch with your children. It's super, super important to harmonize with them. S, set a successful standard. <clears throat> Sorry. H, harmonize. And then A is action, that empower action. People will follow your lead. Approach them in a closed off manner and you can expect the same from them. When you ask someone how their day is as you pass them by in the office, you can ensure that they will give you a quick good thanks with a little smile and a head nod if you're lucky. But what if you come to that same person, stop at their desk and ask, hey, you seem stressed. How are things really going for you? I want you to know that I want to do everything I can to help. I care about you. I promise you that you will not get the same response. If you ask your kid, how was school every single day? You're not providing them with actions that empower action for them to be vulnerable and have that respond. Actions that empower action create an environment where vulnerability can thrive. Empower your conversation. Empower your time and energy you give. And I promise this will be reciprocated. So next is R, which is refresh. <clears throat> we have all been doing the same mundane quarantine routine for what seems like a very long time. It makes things less exciting. It puts us in a routine that we may not enjoy. What have your routines been with your family though? What routine walls have you put up? Refresh. Refresh your goals and the way you interact with people. Refresh your automated replies that you give to people when they ask you questions. The way you engage with your loved ones, refresh. Nothing new happens in the same routine. Refresh the way you approach conversation. When you ask your loved one how they're doing, are you looking for a two-word response or are you looking for a real conversation where vulnerability and connection can truly happen? Refresh your relationship. Refresh the way you interact. Make dinner. Take time off. Break the cycle that you're in. But above all, refresh. So S was set a successful standard. H, harmonize. A, actions that empower action. And R was refresh. So to end it sharp is P, which is possibly the most important which is ponder. Vulnerability will never be created if you don't feel comfortable being connected to yourself. Create time for yourself. Create space for yourself to think. Create a space for you to connect with yourself. How has all this craziness going on in the world truly impacted you? 
Are you really seeing the side effects of what they are that this new normal is creating for you? Without this time for yourself, this time for you to open up, for you to sit and ponder, that only happens with the peeled back layers that we put up on all the walls around us to really get at who you are and what you're feeling. Once that happens, once your walls are down, your vulnerability will excel. How can you be a good financial planner when you can't handle your own money? How can you be a good relationship coach when you're constantly in and in bad relationships? How can you be a steward of vulnerability without being vulnerable with yourself? The answer to that is ponder. So our formula for vulnerability and connection is sharp, quick and easy, but really it's about being connected with the people around you. And so for me, we're going to go through it real quick with Sharp. Setting a successful standard, me with my dad, whenever we have interactions, always one more responses, very surface level. Now, I love my dad more than anything in this world, but re- I did not set the standard of vulnerability with him. So recently, what I did was when I talked to him, I would, I would dig deeper in how he was really feeling because you could see the stress in his eyes. <laughs> I set the standard of going beyond the surface level, and that really blossomed in our relationship. So John, why don't you talk about yeah. harmonize? For me, and for me, harmonize just means speaking the same language. Like um, when we talk about vulnerability, I think like a, a cool refresher, one of our notes is, you know, if, if, uh, if vulnerability was weakness, why does it take so much damn courage? Um, that's sort of like my points. Like it's really easy to look at like the sharp and be like, okay, I can do that. It's easy. But much like Ilya said, this is an everyday thing retuning like where am I speaking from am I speaking from this part or this part am I speaking from the head of the heart um and so harmonize to me is like when I just know I'm not speaking the same language and you know when somebody's speaking Spanish and I know a little bit I have a two-word response for them in Spanish and it's like I see that though in in my own language with people around me in my own family where it's a two-word response because I don't know what to say I'm not hearing them they're not hearing me and so For me, after you set that successful standard, it's easy to speak the same language. It's easy to be vulnerable when you know it's not a passive process. It's hard. It's often the hardest thing you're ever going to do. And when you like accept that and just sort of let it in, um, it's easy to start speaking that language with people. And then when you get there, it just creates this beautiful space. So for me, I start calling this enrollment. I love that. The idea of actions that empower actions. And so for me, it's just... I know that I can't show up to a meeting with a guy uh, and my intention being like, okay, I want him to be, let's say it's, I want, I want this to be a vulnerable, great conversation. I know that I'm going to have to bring it. I have to bring vulnerability. I have to think of like, he's struggling with this. When did I used to struggle with that? I got to share that. I can't just ask a question and, and do the five whys and get it being vulnerable. I got to be vulnerable. It's not about the words. It's about how I show up that day. And what sort of zone I'm in, where I'm coming from. Am I coming from that sage or saboteur? Uh, am I, or am I coming like balanced in? Uh, and so to me, that's what actions that empower actions are, or just, you know, not conceptualizing anymore, just being, being vulnerable, being out there, being courageous and being accepting and loving. And then other people reciprocate that. And I'm going to finish up real quick with reflect and ponder. The story I told you is a constant battle for me. Keith helps me through this. I actually have an army of coaches, but Keith is by far the only one that really works on my heart. And that's where my biggest opportunity is. So I reflect on a regular basis through my morning routines, through my journaling, to say, when am I not living up to my commitment to relationship, vulnerability, trust, and love? I have to do this every day or I fall back into my old ways. I did it just recently with Jonathan. It was not fun, it was painful, but I grew. So with that, I wanted to let you know that this is not an easy thing to do, and it's a constant battle, sort of like training for an MMA fight. You never stop practicing. So with that, uh, Keith, I think we'll send it back to you and open up for questions. Excellent, Greg, way to go, everybody. Get your virtual clappers on, yeah. Woo! Way to go. What a powerful team, bro. You guys did not disappoint. You know, and I love that quote that you talk about. You know, we use it with the Navy SEALs when we're doing training with them, which is the idea of vulnerability to be invulnerable. You remember that quote? Yeah, to be 
to, to, to be, uh, you have to be vulnerable to be invulnerable. Yes, definitely. It's, it's so true. And you think about a team, you got a, a group of Navy SEALs, you know, just use this as an example. And I've got to believe that you got my back. How am I going to know that? I have to test that. It has to be ready. And unless I can trust you and I have made myself vulnerable to you, we will accomplish nothing. It's a fact. In fact, we, we, there's no way we can stand. And so thank you guys. You have done a great job and thank you all of you. I mean, absolutely all of you guys for showing up here and doing a, a great job to John and Jake, uh, uh, both of you guys. You live up to the hype. You know, Greg has uh, uh, talked about you and I'm like, okay, we'll see, we'll see. No, I, I, was, I didn't doubt him a bit. Uh, you guys did well. They, they so let me ask you, any questions? I mean, you guys are getting some great feedback here about vulnerability. And I know that's something that we're not taught. I mean, how do you be a man's man and uh, be vulnerable all at the same time? I mean, it seems like a contradiction. We know it's not, but uh, how do you feel? How do you show emotion? How do you check in the warrior and then still you know, come home and be a, a lover uh, at home to your wife and kids? We say this about the Navy SEALs all the time. They have to be able to hold a baby with one arm and choke the life out of someone with the other. <laughs> I mean, that's tough. How do you do that, right? We have to be able to transition and transitions always make you vulnerable. You know, you can ask Bryce or Nonito or uh, uh, Maximus, anybody on here, anytime you're delivering a punch, right? This is my most vulnerable position. Even when I'm there, you know, I open myself up. Um, so let me ask you, how are you guys teaching young men vulnerability in transitions, vulnerability in still being able to have a strong foundation of who they are, masculinity, but yet feeling and expressing that emotion at the same time? Does that question make sense? I've, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna send send this over to these guys. I, I will tell you that the young men that they've interacted with and the ones that I've met, there are some on that list that they've saved their lives. So I'm gonna talk to them about what that looks like in, in their own generation. So thank you um, for the question. I'll say I'll say for me to have sort of that holding the baby and choking somebody out analogy like present for me. It's like um, I always start uh, much like a doctor would start with anybody with physical health. And so to me, the mastery of physical health is always my end with guys uh, to, to understand. I think one of my favorite quotes is from Jordan Peterson, to be a dangerous man um, who's always at peace. And so yeah. being able, having that capability just for your own sake uh, to just be a, a guy to mess with, um, like a physically prominent dude and never having to use it. Um, and so that's, that's sort of my, been my approach of just, I've, I've found the beauty of working with guys on their physical health opens up this world of anybody who challenges themselves physically knows that that opens up the, the plethora of like self-limiting beliefs that we get to end up talking about. I think that uh, for me, the way that we really create this we destigmatize vulnerability and man, is we, we talk and we walk our talk all the time. Uh, whenever we get the opportunity to interact with somebody, we make sure that we are real with them and we share our struggles and what is going on with us. Um, because for like, we, we love to, to coach people and help them be better. Um, but that means for us to be good coaches, we have had to have our own struggles and to conquer those as well. And so being able to share those, no matter how many tears it takes or, or, or how many you know quivering voices it, it have to go through, it's super, super important to be real with the people that we are interacting with, whether in a one-on-one -on -one thing or it, on you know a large Zoom like this. Um, being real with who we are and actually showing it instead of trying to show up as someone else is super, super important in creating that connection and vulnerability. I, I would, I'll, I'll just add to this, and these guys will bring it up. This is the most connected generation ever in the history of mankind, and the most lonely. The most lonely. They want human, real, authentic interaction. And that's what these guys provide. I, I well saw a question. Said. Well said. Uh, uh, who and how began mending the relationship after the separation? Uh, is that, was that me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I was, I've been with Greg for almost two years uh, working here. And I remember when, um, when this relationship went south, uh, I was there with Greg. Um, and then later on, we had our own sort of issues. Um, and it, it kind of came down to, you know, Greg loves everybody. The dude gives 
all his money, his time, volunteer. He gives his whole Friday to mentoring young guys um, and then doesn't let anybody in. <laughs> and for me and Jake, we're grateful to have had a, a mentor through college, being away from home, having uh, a new set of guidance. And it's sort of like through persistence, uh, I, you know, I think all three of us sort of just hung in for the ride. And, and finally, we've all sort of broken each other down in so many different ways in order to build each other up. And so to answer that question of like who and how began mending, uh, you know, all three of us mm -hmm. uh, got the ball rolling in some different way, but um, it takes, it takes a team. So we, we, I think we knew, we know it's worth it. And let me just tell you something. One of the, one of the best things about being a coach is, is those people that you once mentored are now mentoring you. <laughs> it's this two way thing. That is so I am true. learning. I grew up learning to win, win at any cost. I didn't grow up learning how to love. And these guys are showing me that you can love and win at the same time. And it's an amazing, amazing thing. And I, I'm talking about courage. You know, I'm a very high dominant personality. And there's days I just want to crush and they don't, allow, they don't, they just take it and crush back. And it's been a very big uh, growth opportunity. Keith knows, he's heard the whole story. <laughs> They got that doctor in front of Keith comes in handy every now and then the <laughs> divinity one and the psychology one. Awesome. But uh, any, anyway, thank you for that. It's been my, it's been my privilege, my pleasure, guys. Thank you so much. I mean, and it's so true, right? The, the, the growing never stops. The learning never stops in martial arts. You know, we say just a black belt. All that really means is someone who's failed more than a white belt has even thought about. And you keep learning, you keep growing, you keep going forward. Guys, thank you so much. Let's hear it for the team. Guys, and look for that book. I posted the link. You can find it online, Road to Purpose by Greg Pestinger. Guys, you don't want to miss it. It's fantastic. And I get the honor of writing a little blurb, a forward about it. And it's not about me. It's about this book. Look at it, man. It is really fantastic, Greg. So much value, brother. Thank you so much.